Bam, there we are. All right, I'm glad to see you again this morning. I, got a, I already talked a whole lot of the offering, and you were thinking, man, he's gonna, somebody else is going to preach. No, it's just me. So uh, here we go. And, um, uh, and we're kicking off a new series today, and i got to jump right into it because uh, the last couple of weeks I've been holding you long, you know what I mean? And I know that Mexican food is calling you. So um, some of you are going to go to Mexican just because you have to on Sundays, and then you're going to go home and eat those little cuties in the, in the crock pot. What are they called? Little cuties? I don't know what they're called. I said it earlier. Smokies, that's right. Look, calm down, Super Bowl people. <laughs> calm it down. Anyway, I got to jump right into it. So um, we're going to be doing this series for the next several weeks, all of February. It's called Love Song. We're going to be talking about marriages and relationships. If you're single, don't worry. Matter of fact, the majority of this message is for you, okay? Uh, singles, married people, um, all those pieces. And we're going to be talking about those relationships. We're going to talk about sex. Look, it's just how it is. Um, and I'll tell you in a few minutes when we get to that part, if, if the churches and preachers aren't talking about this issue, I got a couple reasons why, and I'll tell you about them in a minute. But uh, you don't want to miss week three, by the way, because that's when we're going to dive into that. And so um, <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to jump right into all those pieces today. We're doing love song. We're going to be in the Song of Solomon, the book in your Bible is called Song of Solomon, or it's called Song of Songs. Some of your Bibles will say Song of Songs, either one. Um, song of Solomon, and uh, I want you to go ahead and turn to it if you got your Bible with you. We're going to get to it in a few minutes. I'm going to give you some context, but uh, just in case you're looking for it and you're like, oh crap, I don't know where this is. It, it's after, I believe, after Ecclesiastes, before Isaiah. But look, if you don't know where a book is in your Bible, use your table of contents, okay? Ain't nobody in this church going to look at you and be like, hey, you don't know your Bible. No, just shut up. You don't know where Song of Solomon is either in your Bible. So, so <laughs> get it out. Look it up, okay? If you don't have a Bible, we will give you one on your way out at the info desk. No questions asked, no sign-ups, no write, no names, nothing. Just go by there and say, I need a Bible, and they'll give you one, right? You can be, they, they told me they got one particular person who gets a Bible every week, right? Every week. And they were like, Adam, you want me to cut them off? I was like, no, they got to be doing something with them, you know? Building a house, I don't know what they're doing with me, you know? Um, so turn with me to that. Let me, let me give you a little context. So this is in your Old Testament. This book will make you blush, Okay? If there's some people in here, I know there's a few people in here that you don't blush about nothing. Nothing gets you roused. Anybody like that? Like you? Yeah, there's a few. First service, it was like two. Like nothing can make, this book will make you blush. Look, not much gets me rattled. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I, not much. Uh, this book will make you blush. Um, it's a love story. It's written about a thousand years before Jesus. And uh, so in the 900 B.C. areas. And, and, and it's, it's, it, it's this love story. And you can look at it from two perspectives. So you can look at it as an allegory of the picture of Jesus' love for the church or God's love for Israel. You can look at it like that, okay, which it absolutely is. And we're going to talk about that a little bit at the very end. But the second way you can look at it, the second perspective, is you can just look at it as face value, a love story between a man and a woman. And so we're going to dive into that perspective of it today. That's kind of how we're going to dive into it. So, um, now look, I, I said this first service and put my foot in my mouth a little bit, so... Most pastors wouldn't do it the second service, but that, that ain't me. So anyway, I'm going to do it again. Um, so I, I know that there's some folks, I'm going to make you raise your hand, but look, online dating. Um, now, I know there's been some good relationships that have been made on online dating, so I'm not going to make fun of online dating, but so much, you know, um, you know, farmersonly.com. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I'll make fun of it so much, but look, 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 so online dating has this way, people, people project themselves in a different way online. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I was dating online, which I'm not, I'm married, she's in the back, don't be starting her rumors, okay? <laughs> All right, mother of my three children. So, um, but if I was going to be on there, my profile would be, you know, six foot seven, ripped, 220. <laughs> I ain't seen 220 in a long time. You know, a lot of hair. I'd write that on there, but like, my head is full. I got lots of hair. You know what I mean? Like, no gray, you know? Um, and so, I want to give you just a real quick just to get us started, um, real quick, uh, some online dating 101 for you this morning. So um, if you find a woman online and she says she's 40-ish, that means she's 49 and a half, okay? <laughs> if you find a man online and he says 40-ish, that means he's 52 looking for a 25-year-old. And I'm saying, look, see, nobody was like, mmm, creepo, yep. Um, if you find a man online and he says he's huggable, that means he's got on way more than a few extra pounds, and he's haired and Bigfoot, okay? <laughs> That's huggable. Um, if you have a woman online and she says she's romantic, that means she looks better by candlelight. <laughs> okay? All right? Um, if you have a man online and he says, I'm laid back and very close to my family, 
That means he lives at home with his mama, <laughs> and he hopes you have a good job because he ain't got one. All right? That's what that means. Ladies, write that down. Run away from that. Young men in the room, you want a woman? Your job. Um, he, he got another one. All right, so if a woman says, I'm bubbly and fun, that means she never shuts up. Ever. <laughs> Ever. Okay? If a woman says, I'm an independent woman, that means that she has control issues and she will control you. <laughs> and you will like it. All right? <laughs> Last one. Last one. Uh, if there's a man online and he says, I'm average looking, that means he fell from the ugly tree. <laughs> Hit every limb on the way down. Okay? It's funny how people will misrepresent themselves online and how they will misrepresent the, themselves and the qualities that they have and the qualities that they look for. It's real easy to misrepresent that stuff online. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk to you about four qualities that should attract us and then also that we should be trying to attain ourselves, right? Like there should be nothing that you're trying to, you're attractive of that person that you're not also trying to attain yourself, right? And, and if you're single here today, this is, this is perfect for you. And if you are married today, I just want you to know that, that this is still holds true in our relationships and our marriages. Like, what are those qualities that should attract us in our spouses? And then how do we also attain those ourselves? That they're the same thing. So I want to give you four of them today. I want to go through them relatively quick to get to the last ones. That's where we're going to camp out for a little bit. So um, number one, four qualities. Number one, godly character. Starts off with godly character. So go ahead and turn to Song of Solomon. We're going to look at uh, verses 2 and 3 in chapter 1. So right off the bat, verses 2 and 3. But first, number one is godly character. So if you're looking to be attractive to somebody, so the qualities that you are looking to be attractive in in somebody should be godly character. That's what you should be looking at first in that person you're trying to find. Now, what's the bad thing is, is we rarely ever start off with godly character, and we start off with how good she looks or how good he looks. And men, I'm going to tell you in a few minutes later on, that your godly character matters a whole lot more than how good you look, all right? But the first one, godly character. So let's, let's start off in the, in the Bible. So Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. They're going to be a little weird, so just go with me, and I'm going to explain them to you. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Oh, girl got it going on. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. All right. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you, all right? That girl knows how to get to a man's heart, don't she? Woo, she's talking that sweet stuff. Um, if, you're, if you're a dude in the room, um, you should underline or circle or highlight or whatever the line that says your name is like perfume poured out. Your name is like perfume poured out. Let's talk about why she's saying this. So first off, this perfume that she's referring to is really rare, and really valuable. It costs a whole lot. It's purified oil, right? And it's expensive, and it's rare. But what's even more rare, or rarer, I don't know the word to use, but even more rare than the oil was taking a bath back in the day, right? People didn't take baths very often, right? And see, I thank God for today's time, because you wouldn't want to be around me if I didn't shower this morning, you know what I mean, right? Thank goodness. If I can just talk my kids into bathing like they're supposed to, we'll be all right. But so, they didn't bathe very much, and, and it's not only that this oil is, is expensive, but also it makes somebody presentable in public, right? Because they don't bathe that often, so they tend to stink. So the oil is important because it's costly, it's expensive, it's rare, but also it makes them presentable in public. And she says, your name is like perfume poured out. She says, your name, your name, your character, right? is valuable, costly, and it makes you presentable in public. She is talking about his godly character. All them kisses and all that stuff, when she says no one of the young ladies wants you, no one of the young ladies love you, no one of they want to be with you, it's because his name is godly character. The dude is living a godly life. That's the reason that the women want to be with him, not because of his kisses and all that weird stuff. It's because he has godly character and so she's saying that that's rare and that's expensive and that makes you presentable in public and the number one quality that you should look for in somebody else and then you should also be attaining in you for your other person is your godly character 
That's the first thing. And she says right off the bat, godly character. You know, the first thing mentioned in the book, before we get to all the awesome sex stuff, the first thing mentioned in the book is godly character. That's it. Number one, she says your name is like that perfume, that oil. It's, it's godly character. Let me, look, let me tell you something. If, if you want a godly marriage one day, you need to live a godly life today. If you, want a, if you want a godly marriage one day, you need to live a godly life today. If you are here today and you're single, that applies so true. If you want a godly marriage one day, you live a godly life today. If, if you are in here and you're married today and your marriage is not a godly marriage, you start living a godly life today and one day you will have a godly marriage, right? It starts today. It starts with first things first, godly character first. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, we're going to throw it up on the screens for you. Matthew 6, 33 this is an awesome verse, and this is what it talks about. It all begins with, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, he just finished talking about all kinds of stuff, clothes and food, right? Dylan, at the very beginning of the message today, mentions this. He says he takes care of the birds. You know, the birds get taken care of. They got food. They got shelter. Well, he says all that stuff. You, you got it all. Quit worrying so much about doing that first. Seek my kingdom and my righteousness first, and all that stuff will be added to you. Not seeking your spouse first and who you date first and where you work first. No, that, it doesn't work that way. You don't seek that person first and then the kingdom of God and his righteousness be added to you. It doesn't work that way. It's the other way around. It's to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's first. Godly character is first. Your relationship with God is first. And then all those things will be added to you, including that spouse, that mate, that person. That'll be added unto you at that point. See, see, Jesus is very specific on get the first things first. And the first thing mentioned in this is godly character. That first character trait that you want to see attractive in a person is godly character. That first thing that you want somebody else to be attracted to you in is godly character. That's what it's built on. Andy Stanley, a pastor at, um, he's Charles Stanley's kid. Some of you know Charles Stanley more than Andy Stanley. He's a pastor at one of the biggest churches. He's one of the most amazing uh, preachers I've ever heard in um, Atlanta, Georgia, North Point Church. He says it like this. He says, um, be the person uh, that you're looking for is looking for, right? Be the type of person that the person you're looking for is looking for. That makes sense? Don't be the person that your person is looking for. Be the person that that person is looking for in you. Make sense? Right? First things first is God is first. This is going to challenge some of you because see your relationships and your marriages, they weren't built on this, I know. Okay? Don't condemn yourself too much until you give me a few minutes to get there. All right? Give me just a little bit of time. But godly character is number one. Number two. Number two. So we got godly character, then we got growing trust. Growing trust. Now we're going to look at verses five and six. So you're just going right now, we're just skipping forward. You can read it if you want to. Um, th this, is, this is really important, so let's check it out. Dark am I, yet lovely, daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Hold on a minute, don't, don't, don't lose me yet. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyard, so my own vineyard I had to neglect. She's saying that she's dark, right? She's saying that my skin is dark. Her skin is dark because she's been out in the sun because her brothers were brothers, and made her work out in the sun, and she had to take care of that vineyard before she took care of her vineyard. You know, she wasn't talking about her wine vineyard. She was talking about, you know, this, her secret garden. You know what I'm saying, right? Now, this is the thing about us. So our culture now, our culture now, and see, some of you look like this, even though it's January or February, whatever month it is. Um, our culture says that tan is attractive. So some of you look like, you know, it's June, and it's really February right now. Especially white people, okay? And our culture says tan is attractive. And see, some of you, you know, you look like a suitcase. You don't took it too far. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? Sorry. Um, but in this culture back then, lighter the skin meant more beautiful. And see, not white people, but, but black people feel this now too in our own culture. Feel this kind of prejudice, this pushback. Like, Lighter skin back then meant more beautiful because what it meant was is it meant that you weren't out doing manual labor in the fields, right? So lighter skin, higher status, 
you weren't out working in the fields. And so she is, do you know what she's doing in this verse? She is revealing her insecurities to him. You see this? Like she's revealing her insecurities. I mean, nothing says it much more than do not stare at me because I'm dark, right? She's revealing. And look at what she does at the beginning. She does what every woman does, right? She says, dark I am yet lovely, right? She does like you do. Well, yeah, I'm thick, but you know, I'm cute, right? <laughs> and, and look, you, you probably are. But what you're saying when you say that is you're saying your insecurity first. We know that's what it is. You wouldn't say, yeah, but I'm cute if you didn't see the insecurity there. That's what she starts to do. She starts to say the insecurity that she has. She's given up her insecurities. Remember, we're on number two, which is growing trust. So godly character and then growing trust. She starts to reveal to him her insecurity and growing trust starts to happen. That's what we're going to see. Growing trust begins to happen because insecurities get revealed. And then, men, let me tell you something. You want to walk around and pretend like you ain't got no insecurities, but we've got huge insecurities. Our insecurities abound. They're, they're worse than women's. You think they're not, and you won't admit it, and you're going to sit in here and be like, he don't know what he's talking about. You know, but go eat your little smokies today and pretend like that's not the case. <laughs> Crazy insecurities. I mean, we got insecurities about everything. That's the reason, I said this first service got in trouble, but I'll say it again. That's the reason that there are dividers in the urinals at the bathrooms. <laughs> yes, that was a penis reference in church. If you're watching online, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's insecurities. And man, we have them too. But look, I'm telling you something. Growing trust only happens when we start to give up those insecurities to that person and we start to see her do that. So it's, it's, it's godly character first, very first thing, right? And then it's growing trust in a relationship. That quality that you want to attract somebody in, it's growing trust with that person where you can reveal your mess and they don't care, right? And then that's the same thing you want to be for somebody, that person that they can reveal their insecurities and you don't care. Growing trust starts to happen. Ladies, let me tell you something. You better find a guy that has godly character first, but you want to start looking next at growing trust. You need to be able to say, I'm insecure about this. And that person say back to you, we're going to get to it in a minute. I don't care, right? I don't care. Number three, moving a little faster. Number three, higher standards. So we got godly character first, foremost, growing trust, and next, higher standards, higher standards. Now look at verse seven, right after what we just read, verse seven. Tell me whom you, who, you whom I love, so she's talking to him, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? It's an important verse. All right, higher standard. What does this mean? So, veiled woman, the flocks of your friends. What does that mean? Well, a veiled woman back in the day was a woman who gave herself up to men for money. So, a veiled woman back in the day was a prostitute. So, what she's referring to and she's referring to a prostitute. And I want you to notice what she says. She says, why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? She says, that ain't me. Right? I ain't that kind of girl. I have higher standards than that. Higher standards than that. That's not going to be me. I know I got issues, and I know I got problems, and I know my skin dark, but that ain't me. Right? I have higher standards that I'm going to stand up to. I'm better than that, and that's not going to be me. You know what's funny is, is she, because of her skin color, because of the darkness of her skin and the fact that she was working in these fields and all these things, she would have gotten more men by being slutty like the people she references. But she says, I'm not taking that path. Now, how many of us, uh, I know it's getting, you can hear a pin drop up in here. How many of us, this is what we decide to do, we, we cut our standard to meet some person, some man, some woman. We, we cut our standards back, and we really end up becoming what we don't want to be. Right? And she says, that's not me. I'm not cutting my standards. I know my skin not that dark, and I know that makes the, my skin's dark, and I know that makes the pool of men that are going to want me smaller, but I don't care because I'm picking godly character first, right? And I'm not going to lower my standards to that. God, young people in the room, look, this, it, look, this will change your life, right? Jesus will change your life, and then this right here will change your life. Higher standards. 
I am going to. That's not me. I know everybody else is doing it. I know my life would be better if I just did it. It'd be easier. I'd find people more quickly. I'd make friends faster if I did this, smoked this, slept with this person, did this. But I got a higher standard. I ain't doing it. That's not me. And so if you want that to be me, I ain't going to be like your buddies, girls. That's what she says right here, right? I ain't like your friends, guys, who got the, got the girl on the side out in the fields. That's not me, right? Ladies, if you want to know if a dude's for real or not, right, if those higher standards are really there, next time you meet somebody, he's like, hey, girl, how you doing? Let me get that number, right? Let me buy you a drink. Let me talk to you. You go, uh, why should I be like the veiled women beside the flocks of your friend? <laughs> and if that, go, if that dude goes, what? then you don't date him. <laughs> and if that dude says back, oh, girl, I got some quote for you right then. I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots horses. Then you'd be like, let's get married right now. Call Adam up. It's time to do it. <laughs> Higher standards are so important. And look, I'm, I'm going to jump into this, and you, some of you are going to think, why in the heck am I saying this? Because it's 2016. I don't even know what year it is. Is it 2016? You know, sometimes we had a baby, you know, and, and that's it three, should be three weeks old tomorrow. And uh, somebody asked me the other day, yeah, it's cool. We kept her alive for three weeks. Clap, 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 clap. <laughs> Look, when you're a parent, especially the first kid, you don't know how serious that is. We kept that baby alive. <laughs> yes. That first kid, you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> right? Does it breathe? I don't know. Um, but somebody asked me the other day, like, you know, when, what's, your baby, what's your baby's birthday again? And I, and I, I don't know yet. Like, I, I ain't committed at the memory yet. I don't know. <laughs> Took me a year to remember the first kids, you know, like, January 18th, 2016. There we go. But uh, some of you are going to be like, you know, it's 2016. This is out of date, Adam. This is not good. Look, the Bible standards are always good. Like, there is one thing that never goes out of date, and it's the Word of God. Ever, 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 ever. It's the best-selling book ever, every year it is, all the time, okay? If it was based alone on how many books we buy and give away, it'd probably be the best-selling book of all time, right? It never goes out of date. There is no, there, there's nothing that gets old from it. But let me just say this to you. Sexual relationships are between man and woman after marriage. And that's the higher standard that your Bible calls you to. The higher standard that your Bible calls you. I know some of you are going to be like, whoops, screw that up. I'm going to get to you in a minute. Just hold up, okay? Hold up. Man and woman after marriage. And see, when you meet that person, and even now, even if you've already screwed this up, you get two options. Two options, that's it, just two. You can honor God together, or you can sin together. That's it, there's no middle ground. You can honor God together, or you can sin together. One of the two. And you want your marriage based on honoring God together, or you want your marriage based on sinning together? You want your relationship based on honoring God together, or you want it based on sinning together? Look, if, if you want what everyone else has, just do what everyone else does. And look, I'm, I look around and I see all kinds of relationships and marriages and I don't want what they got. I, I see so many of you, you come and you talk to me or you're in your groups or couples groups, you talk and look, I, I hate to be ugly, but I don't want what you got. It's time for you to do something different. If you want what everybody else has, you do what everybody else does. But you want something different, you do something different. If you want something different in that marriage and that relationship, you do something different. If you're young in here and you're single in here and you see all these ladies be like, I don't like the relationship they have. I don't like the way they do that. Then quit doing what they're doing right? If you don't like the fish you catch, and you might want to check out what bait you're using, right? You know what I mean? You over here twerking in the corner, who do you think is going to come to that? <laughs> yes, we said twerking at church, <laughs> along with penis, we said it all, yeah. No, I'm serious. If you're over here twerking in the corner, what are you going to reach? What are you going to reach? What's going to come back, right? Matter change changed the bait you're doing. Look, look, let me tell you something. Valerie and I, I'm going to reveal a little bit too much, personally. Here we go. And I hope that if I offended you with any of those little things I said, that you'll just hold on and listen to the Word of God and not to Adam. All right? Because I'm a sinner, saved by Jesus. But Valerie and I, we, we waited until we were married. Now look, I ain't saying we're perfect, because we did a whole lot of stuff, right? I mean, if there's a line, you know, we went slap up to that line. You know what I'm saying? But we waited until we were married, and I know some of you are saying that's not you, and I'll, I'll get to you in a minute, but our marriage is what it is now because we built it on honoring God together. That's what it is. That's why it is what it is. Now, it ain't perfect. It's far from it. But let me tell you something. It is what it is now because we built it on honoring God together. That's what it is. And see, some of you, you feel a little awkward right now because you're thinking, well, we didn't do that. 
you know? And you're a married couple today, and you're sitting here, and you're saying, we didn't do that. We, you know, did it the other way. I, I want to say to you today, don't just quit because that's the case. What if today, what if prior to your Super Bowl plans and all that stuff, what if you said to kids, we need a little time together? And you, the two of you together, ask God for forgiveness together for that prior. What if it looked like that? Because let me tell you something about Jesus. Let me tell you something about who Jesus is. Jesus is a factory of making new stuff every day. Okay? Jesus makes things new over and over again. That's what he does. He has grace. And when, when we come, when his kids come to him in repentance, right, he takes that puts it as far away from him as it can be. See, I don't know if you know this about God, but God, God knows everything and always has and always will, right? And so for him to not know your sin, which means he has to make himself forget something that he can't forget. Does that make sense? So he's got to supernaturally forget your sin because he knows everything and always has and always will. And he chooses to do that for you. So what if that started off today for you? If you're a couple today and you didn't do it that way, what if you get together today and you say, we're going to ask, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna repent this together. We're going to start new in this. We're going to start building our life and our foundation of our marriage on being godly together. We're going to honor God together. We're going to ask forgiveness. And then God's going to say, you're, it's all right. I love you. I've removed it. You quit worrying about it because I don't even think about it anymore. My blood has covered it. Now, look, if you're single in here today, you're single, dating or whatever, maybe you're dating, and you're going, whoops, we screwed that up too. What well, well, if you just start new right now? Well, Adam, we can't do that. Once we've already done this, you know, it's kind of hard not to. Well, that's just a stupid excuse. Of course it's not easy. It's a higher standard. It's not easy. It's not easy. But it's honoring God, and it will start new and build the foundation of your relationship on honoring God together not sinning together and let me tell you something he will change that for you he will completely renovate that area of your relationship and when you walk into that honeymoon night right it won't just be another day at the office it'll be real it'll be firm in him he's real like that so higher standard number four I gotta hurry up number four so we got, we got uh, godly character, we got growing trust, higher standards, and then consistent encouragement. We're going to camp out here for just a little bit. Consistent encouragement. Godly character, all right? Growing trust, higher standards, and consistent encouragement. Men, you need to start writing. This is the spot where I'm going to come at you, all right? You need to start writing, you need to pay attention. Look at verse 9. Same chapter. One, we're just skipping eight, where the friends talk, we'll go to verse nine. So this is him talking this time, and he says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. So basically, he just called her an adult female horse. Right? Probably not going to do you real good. You guys go home and be like, baby, you like a horse. Um, <laughs> not going to work too good. But look, you need to know you need to know the context of this. It's, look, he is giving her one of the greatest compliments he could give her, and we don't know this because we skip over this. We don't know the context of it, but it's ridiculously important. Remember, he just, he just gave, they just started growing in church. She revealed trust. She reveals her insecurities to him, right? They decide they're going to do things with a higher standard, especially her. That's where she leads off in on it. And then we get back to this, and she's leading higher standards, and look what he says back to her. He says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Now, see, what you don't know is that... Uh, this horse would have been the most highly esteemed horse in that group of horses. And it carried Pharaoh's chariot, and it would have been a perfectly white horse. What's she insecure about? Her dark skin. Consistent encouragement. He says, and, and he says you're like that white, perfect horse. And you see what you need to know also is deeper than that, is that that horse was considered by a bunch of people back then and in that culture to be almost godly, to be heaven-like, right? And so he's looking at her, and he's going, babe, look, to me, you're perfect. To me, you are a gift 
from God. That's what he's saying back to her. Do you see the encouragement that happens from this? The encouragement that begins there, right? Now jump down to verse 15 and the first part of 16. We'll read that a little bit more. You're going to see a little bit more of it. So he says back to her, and we'll throw it up on the screens, I think. There we go. He says back to her, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes are doves. That sounds good, don't it? That's a little bit better than the horse reference. Doves, we get that. We got it, right? Then look what she says back. How handsome you are, my beloved. Yeah, that's right, I am. I added that part. Oh, how charming, right? Oh, how charming you are. They are starting to encourage each other about the things that they're insecure about, consistent encouragement, and they're doing it right now. They're doing it about looks. You see that in this verse? They're doing it about looks. But it started with character. It didn't start with looks. Ladies, it, it started with character. It didn't start with looks to begin with. Guys, it, it started with character first. It didn't start with looks. Those insecurities that are there, they, they're, starting to, they're starting to encourage each other in them. Let me tell you something, guys. I got some good news for you today. Women are awesome, okay? And look, if you're married and you didn't amen right there, and you're going to get your teeth kicked out when you get home, okay? <laughs> Women are awesome. And let me tell you something. Here's what I know about them. I live this, right? Um... If you're a man in here today, women are awesome, and if you are that guy that fell from the ugly tree that I mentioned earlier, okay, you, we know you, we, you know, right, you fell from the ugly tree and you hit all them limbs on the way down, that's just how it is, all right, I used to be good looking, I really did, I used to be good looking, and then it was gone, you know, gone like the wind, gone like my hair, whatever you want to call it, like gone, <laughs> but let me tell you something, men, if you used to be good looking, and you fell from the ugly tree, and you just ain't that good looking, I'll tell you something amazing about women. You love her. You lay down your life for her. You get more attractive to her, even if you're ugly. I'm just telling you. That's my secret weapon, all right? That's my secret weapon, right? I'm ugly. And my wife will be like, baby, you're so good looking. I'll be like, I got this girl tricked on how I love her, <laughs> right? She is high on how much I love her. She thinks I'm good looking. I mean, it's just true about women. And I want to show you something. I want to show you real quick. So he is encouraging her. I don't care whether he's ugly or not. He's getting more attractive to her because he's loving her, laying down his life for her. He's encouraging her. He's saying, look, you dark. You think you're worried about being dark? Look, I think you look like the greatest horse I've ever seen. And I don't know what I'm saying real good because I'm a man, but it's awesome and I mean it, right? And then when she starts to feel that way, I want you to see how she responds to his love, how she responds to that love. I want, you to, I want to show it to you. Number one, she feels special. Special. Turn to chapter 2, look at verse 1. It'll probably be at the bottom of the page you're on. She says this about herself. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. And just long before that, she was saying, I know I'm dark, don't stare at me. And then there's these encouragement, higher standards. And then you get to this part where now she feels special. You see this? Chapter 1, she's insecure. Chapter 2, she's special. She feels special. She responds to his love, and she feels special. This is ridiculously important. And then the number 2 one, so she not only responds by feeling special, she responds by feeling secure. She feels secure. Look at verse 3. This, this is going to sound weird, but I need you to go with me, just like the other one. It's, it's really important. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, is my beloved among the young man, young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Now, I don't know what crazy stuff she's talking about at the end of that verse. <laughs> but the, the one you need to pay attention to is, I delight to sit in his shade. She's starting to feel secure. Now, why would it say shade? Well, what was she insecure about? About her skin, about the sun. And he encourages her, and now she feels safe and secure in him. And she says, I sit in his shade. He protects me. I feel secure in my skin. I, I'm not worried about those things anymore. I'm safe in him, and I'm secure in my skin. In my own skin, but for real, in my skin. Do you see this? Like, I'm safe. I'm special, and I'm secure. Let me tell you something. That's the perfect image 
of what we get in a relationship with Jesus Christ. A perfect, a perfect image of what we get in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We get specialness and we get security. If you're here today and you don't know who Jesus is, you never accepted Christ, I want you to know today that that is what a relationship with Jesus looks like. You are special to him and you are secure in him forever when you take that step and follow him. Let me tell you something. If, you, if Christ would have died for our sins, rose from our sins, and the only person in the world that accepted that gift of the gospel was you, he still would have done it because you're special. And when you step into him, you stand secure in your faith in Jesus. I know we're talking about love and relationships today, but let me tell you something. Everything goes back to Jesus. Everything comes back to Jesus. How we love and love our spouses, it comes back to Jesus. Me and I'm going to get you in a minute on this, but that's how we love our wives, like Jesus loved the church, like Jesus loved you and me and gave himself up for us. We feel special and secure in him in that. We can stand in our insecurities. It doesn't matter in the face of Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know who Jesus is, you've never given your heart to Jesus, man, I pray that you would, that would happen today in the middle of talking about love and relationships and weird terms and all this stuff I've said, that you would just know that Jesus loves you that much. That all you need to do is just give your heart over to him today. You know, since, since December 13th, about 90 people have given their life to Christ in this very room. And it's not, and it's not just something you do or something you do when you're part of it. No, no, it's because you've heard and felt the real truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is that you are special to him and you are secure in him forever when you take it. It's just like what we're reading here right now. When she steps in his shade that's what Jesus does for us. He makes that, that awesome. He is that tree, that apple tree in the garden. We stand in his shade. He covers us from all those things that have gotten us or bothered us. That's what he, she's saying here, like, I'm secure in you. And that's what happens with us and Jesus. It, we're secure in him. He, he, he is the shade from all that. He's the shade from our mess and our past and our sin. He's the shade from all those things, special and secure. And men, um, so she responds to his love by feeling special and feeling secure. And I, I want you to know that um, this is your job in her life. And I, I want to tell you, you do this job in three ways. And women, I want you to refrain from um, any elbows or taking any notes from, for him. Men, I want you to know that this is your role in her life. And you do this in three ways. Number one, you are her pastor. You pastor your wife. You pastor your family. You lead them to God and to Jesus. And you know how you do that the best? See, don't, don't get it twisted real quick. Don't get the image in your head of a pastor that you grew up with. All right? And I know, see, you don't get that image from me. You don't get that here. Right? But I say the word pastor, you usually don't think of me. You think of some other image you got from a long time ago. Okay? Hard to think of a dude in, in uh, t-shirt and jeans and the Bible belt. You know what I mean? But see, what you end up going is, you know, so I need, to, I need to tell her what she needs to do, and I need to point it out in the Bible, and I need to point No, no, no. The way you pastor your wife and the way you pastor your family is you constantly are showing them, here's where I struggle. Here's my problems. Here's what the Bible says about that. Here's what we're going to do as a family. Here's how, we, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to pray together. I know I've been a bad husband this week. I'm sorry. I, I ask your forgiveness. You show the repentance of Christ back again, just like the model of who Jesus is. I mean, that's what you do. You, you pastor your family. I've had so many women over time. I'll say something like that, you know, and they'll say back, mm, I ain't doing what he says. I, he ain't bossing me around. I'm not submitting to him, right? Look, let me tell you something. Uh, men, if you love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, you won't have any issues with submission. Because she will gladly follow the lead of a man who says, Christ is in, is in charge of my life, and I lay my life down for you every day, just like Jesus did for me. No issues. None. And ladies, you find a man like that, starting off with godly character first, you find a man like that and you won't hesitate for him to be the pastor and the lead of your family spiritually. We ain't talking about browbeating nobody. We ain't talking sexist stuff. We're not talking old school mess. We're talking seriously biblical stuff. That is your job as a man in your homes and your families, husbands, is to pastor your family. 
And you know how you do that? Consistent encouragement. Here's where we're doing. Here's where we're going. Number two, you're not just her pastor. You are her provider. Now, this don't mean that the woman don't make any money. Okay? Because, see, some of you ladies, you'd be knocking it out. You know what I mean? Then that's awesome. This doesn't mean that. It's not what I'm saying. Don't, don't get it twisted. I, I'm saying is that you set a tone for the lead in this. Like, we're a tithing family. We're going to give God what's God. We're going to put him first in our finances. Like, you, you're the one that takes the lead and says, we are living beneath our means. We're not going to live on 125% every month. Now, see, I know some of you, I, you, don't, you don't know this yet because you don't look at your numbers enough, but you're living on about 125% a month. And see, if, if you're taking the lead in this as your job, you're saying, no, 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 we're going to live beneath our means. We're going to take what God gives us. We're going to give back to him what's his first, and then we are going to live and steward what he gives us well. You would not come to this church if we lived as a church on 125%. You wouldn't come to it. So why would you expect your wife to feel provided for in her family when you're not leading them, leading her to doing it God's way? You want to freak that woman in your house? Let her freak out about finances. You see, there's, as a provider, it's not about bringing in the bacon and bringing home the money. It's about setting a tone of, here's what we're going to do with what God's given us. We're going to steward it well. We're going to live beneath our means. Number three, you're her protector. Now look, you're bigger than her. Well, most of you are. If you're not, you're in trouble because she can whoop you. Um, you're bigger than her. And I'm not just talking about you lay down your life physically. Right? See, anybody could say it any time. And men do this all the time. I'd take a bullet. I'd jump in front of a train. Well, sure you would one time. Anybody can do it one time. Anybody's stupid enough to do it one time. You don't even have enough time to think about it to do it one time. But will you do it every day? Will you protect her every day? Protect her heart every day? Protect the, the, the unity of your family, the godliness of your home every day? Protect her heart every day. Lay down your life and protect every single day will you do it that's your job not just one time every day see jesus he, he didn't give his life up for us one time well yeah that was an act that happened when he died on the cross and he resurrected from the grave but every single sin you commit is the resurrection happening all over again when god covers it all the time it's everyday protection you don't you don't get when you when you fall in love with christ you're not getting just a one-time thing you're getting it for the rest of your life man you're special and you're secure to me i've covered everything you've ever done and every time you ask for repentance that blood just covers it that's what it is See, I, I want to show you something. This is going to be kind of funny, and then we'll end serious. I want to show you. So, so, men, you see that. Now, when you do these things, when you're her pastor, when you're her provider, when you're her protector, I want to show you what happens next. So when that goes down, what happens in your home? What does she do next? Look at verses um, 5 and 6. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. Now hold up, don't, don't read too far ahead yet, hold up. I had to look this one up, okay? Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. Raisins. Raisins, back in the day, only one way to look at this, okay? Some of you about to blush. Raisins back in the day were nothing more than, they only were an aphrodisiac. They were like us and chocolate, strawberries, right? Sherry's berries, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's all they were. And so all of this is happening. And don't miss out, and don't, don't act like we ain't supposed to talk about this in church, okay? Because this is God-ordained act after marriage. This is a great gift that God created for us. So don't miss it. Because all of this is happening, and he is 
consistently encouraging her, and he is her pastor, her provider, her protector. And then look what begins to happen when it happens. Insecurities are down out the window, and she says, get some aphrodisiacs. Then look at verse 6. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. And we all know what that means, right? You see, that stuff starts to go down. Love happens in that way, and then love happens in that way. You following me? Man, you need to know that. That's the order of things. That's how it goes. Now, I, I just, I want to bring you back real quick. I want to bring you back to those things. I want you to listen to me for a minute. Godly character. Godly character. That God is first and foremost. Growing trust. Growing trust. My insecurities are there, and I trust you enough to reveal them. And that grows all the time, never gets old. As we get older, there's more insecurities, but the trust is growing more, and that was happening all through that marriage and relationship. And consistent encouragement. We're consistently encouraging each other, pastoring each other, looking at them and saying, you know, you're special. You're secure. Now, I want you to go back to the one I skipped. Higher standard. Because that's where it all comes down to today. Our marriages should show, Christian marriages. I know some of you in here, you're not a Christian, and I pray that changes here in about three minutes. Christian marriages should show Jesus the cross, the resurrection, more than they show anything else. A Christian marriage is viewed to the rest of the world. When they look at it, they shouldn't see Adam and Valerie. They should say, what is that? What, what is it? What do you do? You know, we've had an opportunity recently where people have said to us, how do you, what, how do you have this? Like, why do you have this like this? We ain't perfect. I tell you from the stage all the time, but people look and say, how do you have that? You know what it does? It gives us an opportunity to really declare who's really real and who does it. Because it ain't Adam and it ain't Valerie. It is Jesus Christ. That's who does it. Our marriages should scream to the rest of the world, Jesus. 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 My prayer for you tonight today is to set that standard up. Go back to that book that Bible, that holy word, and say, I know it's not easy, and I know it's not hard, and there's a lot of people that aren't doing it, and I'm going to get flack here, and I'm going to get issues here, and it's going to be tough for me, but your word stands strong, and I'm going to pursue that higher standard. That's what I'm going to live by. I want to push you to that today. I want to push you to it. I want you to think for a second about the resurrection today about Jesus coming off that cross, going into that grave, and then standing up after it was all said and done, conquering death, conquering your sin, conquering what you should have gotten, your punishment, standing up into life. And I want to challenge you today as we pray. If you are a married couple today, and here with each other, in the same way that Christ stood up in that resurrection. And you just stand up and declare to Jesus right now that you're going to live for him in your marriage, that your marriage would shine Christ out. If that's you, would you just stand up? Maybe some of you today, you're going to stand up right now and you're going you're gonna to pray together in just a second for that forgiveness that we talked about together right here in church. And if you're a single person today, if you're a single person today and you want that standard to be set today, or you're here today and your, your other spouse isn't with you and they don't know Jesus or they don't believe it and you want to stand up and say, I, my standard will be higher now. 
If that's you, you want to commit that to Jesus, will you stand up? I mean, don't be afraid. Because let me tell you something. When he stepped up out of that grave, there won't no fear. He conquered it all. He stood up like you're standing in the resurrection of Jesus. That's what he did. He stood right up. And that's what we do right now. See, we don't, we don't cowtail. We don't bow down to the world's standards. We stand in the firmness of Jesus today. I want to pray with you. Will you pray with me? I want to pray with you right now. Father God, Lord, you know everything. You've always known everything. Lord, you knew, you knew what today was going to be before it happened. God, you, you knew. You knew that one day this building would be your house. That your word would be preached here. That people would grow in you. You knew it. Lord, you knew when we didn't. When we were baptizing teenagers down in the pool years ago, God, you knew what it was going to be turned into. And you knew that at this moment right now, marriages would begin that healing moment of putting you first in their lives that mass repentance would take place in this church that singles would stand up and say I'm starting new Lord you knew today that we would understand the resurrection more than we've ever understood it by standing up in you today and declaring you as king over our lives and that your character will reign in our hearts that your standard will be set Lord, you knew it was going to happen. I pray over these marriages right now, God, these future marriages, Lord, current relationships as they turn into marriage. God, I pray for your hand to be in this, Lord, that your word spoke today, that I did not get in the way whatsoever, God, that your word is true and powerful, that we'll forever remember. There's families here that will forever remember Super Bowl Sunday 2016 because their marriage focused on God. But they'll be able to point back later and say, no, we didn't wait, but we asked for forgiveness together. And God granted it. And our marriage is built on trusting God together, not sinning together. Father, we love you right now. We lift those up and just pray for them, Father, as they hold each other's hands, as they worship you together right now, as we sing of your resurrection, God. Well, just pray, Lord, if somebody here doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that right now is the moment where you do that. Safe and secure in him. That's it. You just did hold your hand up. If that's you, you just admit to the King of kings and Lord of lords that you need him in your heart and you need him in your life. Jesus, amen, I see your hand. Amen, I see your hand. You just raise your hand and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my soul. Save my life. You died for me. You were crucified for me. You were resurrected for me. Right now I stand up. I raise my hand in victory in you because you're that real. You are the only way, the only truth, the only life. I trust you. I give my life to you. I give my life to you. Father Jesus, we praise you today. Thank you for saving souls, saving marriages. We will always worship you. We will always worship the name of Jesus. We stand in your resurrection power today. In your holy, precious, and mighty name, amen.